Can everybody please take their seat? Good afternoon. Welcome to the George Washington University and another substantive event that is part of the GW Cybersecurity Initiative. I am Rick Knopp. I'm a member of the Board of Trustees of George Washington University, member of the Board of Advisors of the Law School, and I chair the external committee for the GW Cybersecurity Initiative. This event is being sponsored by the GW Homeland Security Policy Institute and by the GW Law School. We have a terrific group of speakers who will provide their insights on the international challenges and opportunities 
for both the law and policy on cybersecurity. The George Washington University Cybersecurity Initiative leverages and builds upon the considerable capabilities <coughs> and programs on cybersecurity we have here at the university. The initiative is chaired by the former uh, Secretary of Homeland Security, Michael Chertoff. Its primary purpose is to engage academia, policy, and industry leaders in thoughtful discussion and debate about the pressing cybersecurity issues and threats in the areas of national and international security, economic competitiveness, technology, <coughs> privacy, and civil liberties. We hope that this initiative will advance the dialogue and lead to solutions. It's now my pleasure to introduce somebody who doesn't need an introduction, Frank Salifo. As most of you know, Frank was the Homeland Security Policy Advisor to President Bush, and he currently leads both the Homeland Security Policy Institute here at the university and the GW Cybersecurity Initiative. Frank? Well, thank you, Trustee Knopp, and thanks to everyone joining this afternoon. Um, I must say, it's really nice having a trustee supportive of issues uh, inside a university, and Rick finds a way to make things happen, so thank you uh, for your support. But um, uh, the topic for today's discussion, of course, there's nothing in the news about uh, cyber, nothing about uh, international incidents, uh, nothing uh, with respect to China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, no activities going on, no manuals that have just been released uh, to get to rules of engagement and norms in terms of international policy. Um, all joking aside, what, what we hope to be able to do here is to be able to put um, some of the most thoughtful people on uh, these issues to give them an opportunity to frame some of the challenges we're looking at. Um, I'm hoping for the sake of uh, 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 academic rigor that we have some differing views and uh, um, to, to be able to think through some of these issues and then to engage everyone in a dialogue here in particular. Uh, I'll very quickly introduce everyone. I think everyone here is known to everyone, but we're starting with Chris Painter. Uh, Chris is the uh, lead, the, 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 the lead for cyber issues within the uh, Department of State. He's the coordinator. Uh, prior to going over to the Department of State, Chris was at the White House in the acting uh, cyber czar position that now Mike Daniel uh, heads up, um, comes to these issues from a a USA perspective, U.S. Attorney's perspective, prosecutions uh, out on the left coast and uh, is no stranger to uh, cyber-related issues. Uh, then we're followed up by uh, Ambassador Marina uh, Kaljarund, who is the Estonian ambassador to the United States. If there were a poster child for a country taking cybersecurity seriously, I think it is Estonia. Uh, they're home to the new NATO Center of Excellence for Cybersecurity. We just took a bunch of our MBA students to visit Tallinn and meet with all the ministries, uh, um, uh, including uh, the president of Estonia, which was fascinating. And, and I might note she's a, a wonderful friend and was in the in Moscow as the Estonian ambassador, which is tough under any circumstance, but was there during the, o during the 07 distributed denial of service attacks on uh, the banks. So uh, we'll hear next from Marina. Then uh, uh, um, we have Scott Charney, who is a corporate vice president at Microsoft. When you think of cyber, what, what else can you think of other than Microsoft? It's, uh, uh, it's literally part of our consciousness and DNA in terms of cyber issues. But Scott came to Microsoft uh, with a long history on cyber issues. I recently introduced him as a, uh, as a Paul Revere on these sorts of issues. He was at the Department of Justice uh, at the computer at chief of the Computer Crimes Division, uh, prosecuted a number of fascinating cases, uh, both from a cyber perspective, way before it was hot, and uh, as well as economic and industrial espionage cases, and, and played a key role in devising the Economic Espionage Act of 97. Um, Scott was also the chair of the, uh, uh, of the 
um, G8 cyber crimes uh, um, uh, group that was grappling with these issues uh, uh, and was instrumental in the uh, Council of Europe's uh, convention along those lines. Then we hear from Jim Lewis, who is absolutely no stranger to cyber issues and cyber policy issues at uh, my old home, the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I think Jim's uh, uh, initiative that Scott was also part of on presidential priorities for cyber. He and Harry were the co-chairs. Okay, even better. Um, it really did shape the agenda for uh, either administration that would have come in to, to be able to grapple with, with cyber issues. And it's still looked at as the, uh, as the uh, gold standard in, in many of these issues. And, and the bestseller in China. <laughs> that should tell you something. They pay for it? They paid for it? It's a bestseller? They told me, give us permission to publish without charge, or we'll publish it anyhow. Okay. What an offer. Any viruses? <laughs> um, all right. And then we've got, uh, uh, we hear finally last, but by no means least, from uh, Jay Healy. Jay is, uh, comes to these issues also as one of the early cyber warriors out of the uh, Air Force. Um, we worked together briefly at the, at the White House, and now he's at the Atlantic Council, where he continues to look at um, uh, the, uh, especially U.S., E.U., but also more broadly speaking, uh, cyber-related issues. I have uh, gone on too long already. Maybe we're going to start with um, Marina, if that's okay. Then we'll go to Scott, then we'll go to Chris, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go to our provocateurs on the, on the think tank side, if that uh, is okay. So, Marina, the floor is yours. And Marina, I, she has to leave a little early, but the DCM is going to come in for the questions. They usually uh, do. For the hard <laughs> questions uh, after she leave. gets to leave. So. The DCM answers the questions. <laughs> <laughs> Marina, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, Frank, thank you so much for a very kind introduction, and I'm always very happy and pleased to be at uh, George Washington. I feel it's like my own alma mater soon, at least some part of it. And I'm really happy that the program is cooperating so closely with our educational institutions, and you had the chance to go to Tallinn and to see what my country or my government have done in the field of cybersecurity. Well, as I'm the least cyber competent person <laughs> in this panel, so I hope that I'm allowed to start with some general remarks and the professionals and real experts will carry on. I think that today everyone might have a different opinion about how much of a threat cyber attacks really pose. But there are some things where we all agree. First, today's world is more e-dependent and e-vulnerable than, than ever before. If I draw comparison from my own country, in Estonia today we have about 300 uh, services that provided in internet. Banking, schooling, police, everything. So it's developed at the same time, we are very vulnerable. Cyber attacks are part of today's reality and they can't be stopped. We are not likely to be told anytime soon who is behind the cyber attacks, even if sometimes we might have very good clues or intelligences might put the dots together. Almost every attack is international and almost every response has to be international. Also, prevention of the cyber attacks. Cyber is very complex. It involves very different concerned parties who might have very different interests. And cybersecurity in Teralia is also finding the right balance between security and freedoms, human rights, <coughs> national hard security and soft security, public-private information sharing and cooperation, and so on. With all these facts or these grounds, we can say that cyber is an especially challenging, challenging field for both policymakers and lawyers. There are different forums and different institutions and organizations to deal with cyber today. Uh, starting with the United Nations, including the meetings of the United Nations Office for Disarmament Affairs 
and United Nations group of governmental experts in cyber. Then OEC, its internal working group led by Ambassador Ian Kelly, which is aiming at crea creation of cybersecurity trust among different states and confidence building measures, and they can continue. And the second group of international organizations, institutions that are uniting, if I might say, like-minded countries. NATO, EU, from their uh, regional organizations, from their bilateral cooperation. Some words about NATO. NATO cyber strategy was adopted in 2011. It was a step in the right direction. It was a necessary step in the, in, the, in the right direction and integrated cyber defense more than ever before with alliances activities, meaning planning, exercises, exercises, capability development, and so on. To some extent, it also clarified the division of labor within the alliance. We had high expectations going to the NATO summit in Chicago a year ago. Cyber was mentioned there, but I can't say that there was a progress that maybe the most active NATO members in cyber wanted to see. What we want today, we want NATO to take much more active role in cooperation, for example, with civilian authorities of the members of the alliance, but also in international cooperation, for example, with EU. Coming to EU, a month ago, EU adopted its cyber strategy. It focuses on the need to step up EU-wide preventive efforts in the area of cybersecurity and comprises internal market, home affairs, foreign and security policy. From the angle of cybersecurity, cyberspace issues. And what is very, very good, or what we like very much, is that the EU cyber strategy uh, pays special attention to cooperation with third countries. Third countries meaning everybody. Hmm. But with special attention with those countries who are again like-minded and active in the field. So perhaps needless to say uh, today and here that EU pays very much attention to cooperation and close cooperation with the United States. We're on the same page. Maybe we not agree on all details of cyber security, cyber education, cyber cooperation. We have different approaches towards soft hard security. We might, we might have different approaches towards cooperation with uh, private sector but we see that there are lots of points where we agree and we have to work on those points as we are like-minded nations. And yesterday there was a great hearing in the subcommittee on Europe, Eurasia and emerging threats where Chris was the main witness. And of course we follow very closely the legislation in the United States, and we want to see that the United States also incorporates uh, international cooperation in its legislation. As an EU member state, I can say that, that for the EU delegation here in Washington, D.C., cyber, uh, cyber cooperation, cyber security cooperation with the United States is a clear priority for this year, for the coming year. So EU delegation and most active member states are dedicated to that. So it's becoming more and more topical. As to cyber law, Estonia, in Estonia we share the view that cyberspace should be free and open, governed by the established human rights principles and laws that we apply in our normal, not cyber life. At the same time, it needs some regulation. Our approach is very pragmatic. Out there, we have international law. And we have to analyze the existing international law. And we have to apply the existing international law before starting drafting new conventions or new legal norms. Because what we see, we see that once we start drafting, it takes tens of years. 
And unfortunately, those countries who are standing behind drafting new international laws, they're just sometimes taking time. They are hiding away from real applic application of the existing law. I'll just bring the example of the same Budapest Convention. We have it there. And those countries who are talking about writing new laws have not ratified the Budapest Convention or its protocol. Maybe the convention is not perfect, but at the moment it lays the ground. We are open to the understanding that maybe at some point we should think about drafting a new international convention or maybe, maybe amend some conventions. We're open. But what we say is, let's start today with the norms, laws, regulations that exist. And finally, I would like, just like to mention that uh, the handbook, daily manual, which with, uh, uh, with the help with, by Atlantic Council and Georgetown will be launched next Thursday here in Washington, D.C. It was launched last Friday in London in Chatham House, and it's the first attempt to codify how international law applies. So it's the restatement of international law as it exists today. It does not suggest future directions of international law. It isn't an official document. It was written by about 20 experts, including American experts of international law, and uh, with cooperation with the Committee of the Red Cross and the US Cyber Command, and we see it as a living document and the first attempt to codify or to, to give some picture about the international law that could be applied today in cyberspace in the finish here. Thank you, Marina. And before, Scott, I turn it over to you, I just want to welcome my co-conspirator, which is probably the worst term to, to talk, call a lawyer, but I see our, the dean of our <coughs> law school, Greg Maggs, who uh, has joined us, and he is uh, co-sponsoring this event with us, as uh, Rick had mentioned, and he just got promoted to 06 as a JAG, so uh, congratulations, Greg. So, <clears throat> so as a former government person and now an industry person, I want to raise two different challenges. Um, the first one really relates to the mechanisms that we use to address the problems we face. Um, more specifically, if you look at the way countries organize, they have different organizations and different authorities to deal with different kinds of problems. So if you have a criminal problem, you use the FBI and wiretapping capability. If you have an intelligence problem, you use foreign counterintelligence side of the FBI and FISA. If it's um, a war problem, you have the Department of Defense and they have you know, different authorities um, for warfare. And in the context of cyber, in the physical world and in the context of cyber, what organizations we use and what authorities they have are dependent on two factors, who's attacking and why. And the two things you don't know in a cyber attack is who's attacking and why. <laughs> As a result, you know, governments are having a very hard time figuring out what the appropriate mechanisms of response are. And if you want an example of that, you can simply think about the debate in the United States about whether civilian authorities or intelligence authorities should be monitoring computer networks to deal with crime slash national security threats. Right? So that's one set of problems. And you know, we experience this in the government, and I think those issues are still very real. Um, if you look at you know, debates over current legislation, for example. The second thing is, from an industry perspective, it has been interesting to me, and I talked about this a little earlier, but it's been interesting to me to watch the rhetoric and to be engaged with groups that are heavily inside the beltway on this issue of um, how to address foreign attacks. And I say that because um, I've been working with the American Bar Association on a group of national, a group of uh, national security experts. And in that context, as we're sitting around the room, they often say, well, if we're under attack, what would we do? And would we launch an offensive counterattack? And I keep looking at them and saying, what do you mean by we? Okay. Because I work for Microsoft, our 
Windows operating system is on 1.2 billion computers all over the world. A majority of our revenue is made overseas, and that will be increasingly so in the future because the U.S. market is heavily saturated in IT, and most of the biggest growth opportunities are in other parts of the world. So from a Microsoft perspective, when you see this rhetoric, you say, well, what's the outcome of that? Well, you could say, okay, um, it's us versus them, and you're not quite us, you're partially them, because if they're under attack, they will call us for help and we'll help, just like we would for any U.S. customer, including the U.S. government. But the other thing that I always learned um, from my days at the G8 and OECD is reciprocity is hell in foreign affairs. So to the extent the U.S. says, okay, let's ban all of this stuff from these parts of the world, what do you think the reaction will be? Those parts of the world will ban American stuff. Is American national and economic security improved or harmed if U.S. products cannot be sold in foreign countries and foreign companies, countries therefore build indigenous competition because they have no choice. So in a lot of these issues, when you see these kinds of discussions going on, you have to remember that as the U.S. does things, other countries will respond in kind and vice versa. It really comes back to something I used to say in my G8 days, which is I had a very, very clear appreciation <coughs> of my strategy, which was I should be able to do anything I want to you, but you shouldn't do it back. I found that really didn't resonate very well with most <laughs> countries. <laughs> and so I always <coughs> encourage people struggling with these challenges to remember that the supply chain is completely global. American companies and foreign companies are all dependent on that global supply chain. And as industry players, we can help with information assurance and help people defend themselves, but we cannot take sides in nation-state IT, you know, aggressive conflict. It just doesn't work. Thank you, Scott. And before we get into questions, because I know there are going to be many, Chris, I, I mean, uh, being at State Department, 20 years, 10 years ago, cyber issues were not high on the diplomatic uh, agenda now. You have heads of state, including the President of the United States, talking about cybersecurity issues with other countries. You have treaties, Australia, U.S. Australia, specific to cyber. Uh, what should we be thinking now? So, as I think many people on this panel uh, would affirm, the, the fact that this has gotten so much attention now, both attention in the media, but certainly attention at a much higher government level, uh, has really been the product of the last few years. And, and as Scott can attest, I mean, uh, you know, I, I also chaired that group after Scott did. Uh, and uh, it was fortunate that Janet Reno cared deeply about these, uh, these issues back then and really ahead of her time in, in doing that. Uh, but senior policymakers, by and large, until relatively recently, this was seen as a technical issue and not as a policy, policy issue. And I think the real transformation that's happened over the last four years, and started a little before that, is that this is now seen as a real policy issue, and my building as a foreign policy issue, but in the rest of the government as a national policy issue, both a security issue, but also a governance issue and a freedom issue, and really uh, an understanding that the future of the internet is something that we depend on for economic growth and innovation and social growth. And it's not just us, but the rest of the world, and uh, that's something we need to preserve. And I think there's also a sense that both in terms of cyber threats, you know, technical or operational cyber threats, and in terms of policy threats, we're an inflection point. There's lots of things happening. Uh, this issue is being debated, and virtually, I can tell you, there's not, it's, you know, cyber is the new black, right? Every single uh, international forum, every bilateral partnership we have uh, wants to talk about cyber. It's now become the thing that's really all current. And, and for us who have been uh, pushing this issue and, and trying to make sure attention was uh, paid to this issue over the years, that's really important. It's really gratifying to see that level of attention because that really does drive policy. And the fact that you have 
President Obama mentioning cybersecurity in his, uh, in his State of the Union address is really remarkable. Uh, and that's important among all the priorities we have as a country. I think that's really important. So, you know, I, I would say that there's a lot of different activities across the board. Uh, my office was created a little, uh, just about two years ago now, and it was the first office created in a, in a foreign ministry to coordinate and really bring together our global diplomatic engagements on these issues, everything from internet freedom issues through to the crunchy bits of international security and the law of armed conflict and how we build and try to de-escalate conflict and make sure it doesn't happen. We're more in the conflict prevention business than we're in the conflict having business. Uh, and and in, in between is cybercrime, cybersecurity, internet governance issues, that whole range of issues. And since that time, uh, there have been about 10 other countries have also created uh, similar posts in their foreign ministries, just like many countries now have national strategies. And that wasn't true a number of years ago. So it's important to have that level of interest. It doesn't mean at all that we've solved all the problems here. We all know more than we ever have before what those problems are. But part of the reason we do is people are paying attention to those problems. Uh, I thought, you know, especially because this is being uh, co-hosted by the law school, I, I talk a couple minutes about some legal aspects, uh, uh, just to say, uh, you know, just to help out. Uh, one area I think is important. So I, I mentioned this, this spectrum of different issues, and there, uh, there are certainly legal issues among those. And, and uh, like Scott, I'm a recovering lawyer. I don't play a lawyer anymore, but I'm, I'm uh, a former prosecutor and recovering lawyer. Uh, and uh, as I often say. You know, I tell you a lawyer joke, but the problem with lawyer jokes is that lawyers don't think they're funny and non-lawyers don't think they're jokes. Uh, so I will uh, instead focus more on some of these legal issues. One I think that's really important is something the United States has said, and it was really on the vanguard of saying for some time, which is that existing international law applies to cyberspace just as it does in the phys physical world. That is a uh, very important concept. It means a couple of things. First, we don't need new norms in cyberspace. We apply existing norms, and they apply in different ways, but we apply existing norms in cyberspace. So it means, for instance, in the political military arena, it means that international humanitarian law, or the law of armed conflict, applies in cyberspace. And that has lots of implications. And clearly, the Talon Manual, which is in, uh, you know, we're still looking at that, certainly, and, and it was written by a group of private people, and that's great. And there were even dissenting opinions within it, but it's, it's something that it, you know, at well, its core, didn't. It affirms that existing international law applies, and, that, and that's an important concept. So that means principles of distinction, uh, you know, not targeting civilian targets, proportionality, uh, proxies, all these tar things that we know something about in the physical world apply to cyber. We're still working out how they apply, but that's an important concept. Uh, the UN uh, uh, Human Rights Committee last year uh, issued a resolution that says that you have the same rights online, human rights, International Declaration of Human Rights, online as you do offline. Now, that seems self-evident to a lot of us, but not so much for many countries around the world. And that's really, I think, an important concept as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's interesting that uh, uh, the ambassador mentioned the EU cyber strategy that just came out. If you look at the, internal, the, uh, the international portion of that, which is written by their external action service, uh, it mirrors very much U.S. policy in terms of saying existing international law applies and that we need to build norms of behavior uh, around the world and get a consensus around those norms. We need to build confidence between states uh, and, and uh, certainly an endorsement of the Budapest Convention. So now shifting to that criminal bucket, uh, the Budapest Convention and cybercrime, you know, I think in cybercrime we've had somewhat of an advantage because we were thinking about cybercrime even before people minted the term cybersecurity. Cybercrime was a, a topic. It was something we were dealing with. Now, it may not have been on the front pages of every paper. Occasionally it was when something big happened, but it was something we were looking at. And so we're a little more mature in that area than, than many of the others. But I think it is important that we have this global instrument that's now 10 years old uh, that, uh, that was written by the Council of Europe, but more and more countries can sign up for. And it's an important document. Now, I will say that, going back to the inflection point, there are some countries who... Uh, as a political matter, do not want to sign up to this and try to encourage everyone else not to sign up to this and feel that we need a new uh, UN global convention, which, as the ambassador said, would take about 10 years to negotiate. It took uh, six, I think, for the Council of Europe convention, as I recall. Uh, I still have one of our, our former colleagues who I, I love it. There's a picture of him at the negotiation with his head in his hands, uh, looking <laughs> defeated. <laughs> uh, and that, you know, those are long and hard negotiations. But what you get out of that is something not the same level of robustness that the uh, Budapest Convention 
Is that, and we, frank, frank, we can't waste the time. This is a real problem that's happening now. We need to build networks for cooperation. We need to have the laws in place, but also have networks of cooperation. And I think that's really important. Um, and the, um, we've seen activity in places like, now to move to the governance bucket for a moment, uh, the uh, OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which uh, issued last, about two years ago now, internet policy making principles uh, that emphasize transparency, multi-stakeholder governance, that's a core, anyone who followed the WICKET, uh, uh, the World Conference for Information Technology, I guess, the, 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 the meeting in Dubai where it didn't really end in consensus because it strayed into more internet regulation. And it was an interesting conference because I think it highlighted the real division here where you have uh, certain states who are more about regime stability than they are about cyber stability. Uh, and who are worried about content and worried about the control of content, also evidenced by something called the Code of Conduct that was uh, for information security that it was uh, uh, submitted by Russia and China and the UN. Those are real policy challenges and they're different views of the world uh, and it means that I think from our perspective, uh, we absolutely are gonna continue to engage with Russia and China. Uh, we have, we're gonna continue to. However, I think we also need to be uh, uh, realistic in building a consensus around a like-minded strategy that really emphasizes the norms that we believe in. I set it out in our international strategy for cyberspace. Uh, and, uh, and some of the ways you deal with some of these problems diplomatically, you know, take the theft of intellectual property, trade secrets as one of the issues that, that's au courant right now. Uh, one way you do is you build, you build a norm around that not being acceptable state behavior and states that are outside of that understanding over time get marginalized. This happened with money laundering back in the 70s, for instance. So there are things that you can do diplomatically. There are cooperative things you can do diplomatically, uh, working to uh, respond to denial of service attacks by working with other countries, uh, building a norm of cooperation so that we're asking countries, both uh, countries that we deal with all the time and new countries to cooperate with us in combating a threat. That's important. You can build, you could do confidence and, confidence and transparency measures for those states where there's maybe some distrust, just understanding how they're organized, maybe having hotlines between them. I think that's an important part in the political military bucket. Uh, so there are a lot of different things you can do. And, one of the, and, and, and even compared to two years ago, we have launched now in the last year all of government. And this is important. This goes to Scott's point. You know, one of the things that I think has been a vast improvement since the time Scott's in government uh, and I certainly saw it when I was, was there too, is that we are far more organized as a government. We meet far more often. There's far better coordination. People try to look at those different tools we have and, and apply them in a whole government way. Uh, and that's important, but that's what we try to impart to our foreign colleagues too. We have whole of government to whole of government dialogues. We include the private sector and others. Uh, and we talk about a range of issues and we've launched those dialogues with India, with Brazil, with Korea, with Japan, with Germany, uh, obviously, we have an EU-US working group uh, and many others and, and, and South Africa. And it's important to have those dialogues because those countries are just looking at this. And finally, and I'll, I'll end, uh, one of the things that underlies all this is efforts to do more capacity building. And that's reaching out to countries to build institutions, but also to build capability. Uh, we've spent a lot of time in Africa doing that, in Kenya, regional conferences in Kenya and Senegal and Ghana, uh, again, incorporating private sector participants try to model that to countries who may not have the same uh, culture we do that to, to talk to the private sector about issues, uh, but also to talk about this whole range of issues that we're facing in cyberspace. So on the one hand, the challenges are daunting. On the other hand, you know, I'm optimistic because we're getting a lot of attention. Uh, if you told me five years ago we'd have these kinds of institutions in place and this attention to the issue, uh, I, I wouldn't have believed it. So I think we've really come a long way. Thanks, Chris, and I'm sure there'll be lots of questions on Russia, China, and some of the issues since you brought that up, but very, very thoughtful. And Jim, and, and then Jay. Great, and you, you probably don't realize it, but uh, uh, with Scott and with Chris, I was on something called in 19, the mid-1990s called the Secure Public Networks Working Group at the White House, and we did a great job, didn't we? Uh, in solving the problem. <laughs> and, and I used to have to go with a guy named John Deutsch, who was uh, technically, I guess I was reporting to him at the time. <coughs> and John Deutsch had his job, and we would go to these meetings with a guy named Ira Magaziner. Yeah. There were two working groups at the White House. One did security, 
One did sort of the internet governance and e-commerce stuff. And um, the meetings themselves were always fun because it turned into a fight about who indeed was the world's smartest man. <laughs> um, I was always bored. My thing was, why are we talking about this I can't thing? Let's talk about something interesting. Let's talk about communications interception. Um, didn't go over very well. The part that might be worth talking about here, and I'm just going to flag some issues, is at the dawn of the Internet, when the U.S. decided to commercialize it, we split security and governance. And now they have come back together. Right? There would not be two working groups anymore. There would not be a group <coughs> that was chaired by this. And one of the things that came out from the wicket, I think, is the importance of governance and thinking about governance. One of the issues, you can help me out here because I'm wrestling with this and I don't know what to do. Uh, and so I'm interviewing people. I'll interview you guys. Um, we have this multi-stakeholder model. Uh, it's no longer adequate. That doesn't mean we should throw democracy overboard. It doesn't mean we should throw multi-stakeholder overboard. It means we need a new narrative, as some people call it. We need a new argument that explains why a multi-stakeholder approach is appropriate. And it's funny, when you talk to some of our uh, foreign colleagues, uh, they'll say things like, there is no such thing as the private sector. And what are you guys talking about? You know, just get a grip. Uh, and then we have to go back and say, no, the Internet is wonderful because it promotes growth. And it's like, run that by me again. Uh, China's growing at 10%. The European Union is in recession. Why is the open Internet so crucial? I'll get back to you on that one. Trust me, in the long term. So help us with a, what is a more compelling multi-stakeholder argument than the one we have now? Um, Chris and the ambassador brought up the issue of like-minded. This is a crucial one, and it's a crucial decision point. Um, in some ways, we have to pursue global agreement with uh, some of the less friendly countries. In other ways, to make progress, maybe we have to move to an approach that emphasizes the like-minded in a way. But if you do that, you have to avoid two problems. The first problem is, how do you stay engaged with Russia and China? The second problem is, how do you avoid what I would call the sin of the Council of Europe Cybercrime Convention? I love it. I want to tell you right now, I pledge on this chair. I think it's the best <laughs> cybercrime convention out there, much better than the Shanghai Cooperation Agreement. That said, when you talk to um, non-European countries, what they say is, why do you want me to sign this? I wasn't involved in the drafting. So when we think about redoing a multi-stakeholder argument, we, we think about doing a like-minded approach, how do we do it in a way that brings in the new powers? They weren't around when you guys were negotiating, right? When I went and talked to countries about communications interception, I did not talk to the Indians and the Brazilians, right? Uh, I can't tell you who I talked to, but I, talked to, I didn't <laughs> talk to them, right? Now it doesn't make any sense. So how do we, how do we make like-minded work? Um, I think we have this problem with the authoritarian regimes. They have a vision of the internet and of global governance and of international rules that is very different from ours. And this is not the transatlantic era anymore, right? And so the Russians and the Chinese go and they have a compelling development argument, which we have not mastered. And they say, why are you cooperating with these people? They're in recession. Well, you know, look what they did in the Middle East. Um, we have the approach, right? Deal with us. Not always persuasive, but Wicket was a surprise. Remember, more countries supported their, the bad guy's position than our position at Wicket, right? That was a bit of a shock. And so some people talk about electronic Pearl Harbor. Sometimes I call Wicket a digital Dunkirk. We were able to get in the lifeboats and escape without being defeated. It wasn't a victory. How do we think of a strategy to deal with authoritarian regimes? And this will be a long-term struggle. When you talk about dealing with the Chinese, in negotiating with them and on other issues when it was a very different power relationship between the US, Europe, and, and China, um, it still would take years to get them to change their mind, right? Years of constant pressure. The administration's doing a great job. Uh, that some of the things you've just seen in the last week with the President and the Secretary of the Treasury and Secretary mm -hmm. Kerry, we're on the right road, but this is going to be a long road to deal with those authoritarians. Um, finally, and there's an issue that no one has touched on, which is uh, sometimes this comes up, but it comes up some in the drone thing, right, sometimes, and I'll bring that as an example of a new technology. The president has a responsibility to defend the nation, and I'm, I'm touched by the concerns of our foreign counterparts that we might be mean to them. I'm touched, but I really don't care, right? How do we defend the nation in a hostile environment? 
realizing that we also have all these different uh, negotiating goals that we need to operate in a global economy, but we are in a hostile environment. We have responsibilities as a nation to defend ourselves, to defend the American people. How do we do that in the context of dealing with the like-minded, dealing with the authoritarians, building a compelling multi-stakeholder model, working with these powerful new nations? It is a responsibility we cannot avoid, right? And the recent incidents with Iran show why attention to national defense may be a higher priority than you might think. So there's a bunch of issues for you. If you have any good ideas, send them to me. I'll be sure and plagiarize them. Uh, <laughs> just a joke. Uh, <laughs> no, these are hard issues. And there has been a lot of progress. I mean, one of the things I think all of us bring is we have been doing this for a while. And think of where we were 15 years ago. Amazing progress, but not enough progress to say we are safe. Thank you, Jim, and I think you bring up a lot of points I want to <clears throat> touch on uh, in terms of what those organizations are, and it's not the transatlantic uh, era anymore, but there still are trusted relationships from the Five Eyes all the way through that I think play significant roles in this domain as they do in any other domain. Um, Jay. Yeah, that's a great point. It's something that we try at the Atlantic Council to say, look, we don't have a European problem on this, but we can look to the Europeans to help us solve these issues because they're very close. And we seem to be doing this panel in order of um, uh, receding hairlines, so uh, I do get to go last. Um, so first, if you work at a think tank, you find yourself, a significant portion of your job is throwing rocks at either uh, people that either had the job you used to have or, or who have the job that you want. So a lot of times we're really beating up on government um, and there's two things that have been in the last year, one in the last year or so, and then one more recently that I really want to thank the government for because um, I beat them up the rest of the time. One is the international strategy um, for cyberspace is just an excellent document. Um, I left the White House uh, eight years ago, and I have never since uh, I left felt jealous about the people inside and said, oh, my gosh, they get to work on that document. They are so lucky that they got to do this. Um, and that was such a good document because uh, it really does come out with American, American principles and what we're about. I also, for a while, have been throwing stones about if we are upset with Chinese behavior about espionage, then we should tell them loudly, frequently, publicly, and all of the time. And we should never shut up. And it's really clear um, over the last couple weeks that the administration is completely on message for that. It's something that many of us has been talking about. Stop treating this like it's a secret that you can't, you know, a year ago you could hardly even string together China and cyber without some government per person shushing you and coming, <laughs> and, and coming up um, and we've clearly gotten past that. I would egg on even more, um, even more public. Let's come out with our evidence like Mandiant did. Uh, let's really name and shame. As we are yelling this, I would also keep our ears open so that when China says we are seeing some of these attacks coming from the United States is undeniably true because we have a dirty internet that we've got, we host lots of botnets and lots of this others. And as we are yelling at them to stop their behavior, I also hope that we're very active in, li or we're kind of active in listening so that we can help take away that. So when, if, if a China spokesman says, these bad things are happening, we can say, thank you, tell us about it, and our spokesmen come out and say, please tell us and we'll look into this, so that we can keep them from turning um, the, some of the debate where everyone thinks the United States is out slashing left and right in cyberspace, where we can turn that around and say, let us cooperate with you to, um, to make this better. Uh, where I really want to do my talk is, um, to, to simplify for a bit, because cyber people for 15 years, we've been kind of making this too complex. It picks up on Scott's point a bit. When you hear people talk about cybersecurity, we, we mix up things a lot of times, and Scott did a good job of bringing, uh, breaking them apart. I'm going to unpack them a little bit more. We tend to be talking about one of four things. We either talk <coughs> about technical approaches. Um, of if you hear someone say cybersecurity is bad, 
we need a better firewall. We need users to do better. We need better passwords. We need um, ICANN to do a better job. They're, they're all in the technical approach. We also have the crime approach. When you hear us talking about the Budapest Convention, we need smarter lawyers. We need to train judges. Um, we're approaching it from, from a criminal approach. We tend to be good at that. There's a, a third set of people that are approaching it as straight espionage um, and saying, so if you say cyber, their mind says signals intelligence. And, and to them, that's what cyber is, and that's, and that's the problem space and the solutions. Uh, and the last is warfare. We're militarized. And so the Tallinn Manual isn't talking anything about technology, crime, or espionage, or not much about espionage. It's, it's predominantly about, about looking at the warfare model. And even that's so obvious when we talk about it like this, we are so bad about, about being clear, not, not this panel, fortunately, but we as a community about which one we're talking at a time. What's a cyber attack? Well, each one of those four has a different, exceptionally valid view of what cyber attack is. And we get that. In one, it's a crime. In another, it's, it's a potential act of war. In another, it's something that gives you root actual, you know, root privileges or affects confidentiality, confidentiality, integrity, or availability. And even though that's so obvious, it has literally killed years of progress of us saying, oh, we can't define this. And just knowing, no, we're seeing four, four separate issues, and, and attack means four different things. One of the other things that I think has really affected us when you look at it, that we help see it in these, in these four different ways, is that three of those are dominated by government. The crime, the espionage, and the warfare are where governments play. And you, me, corporations, our job is not to be a victim or to get out of the way, predominantly. There's not a role, a primary role, for the private sector in any of those three. And so I, this is one reason why I think many government people, especially when they come to this fresh, have a difficult time and stumble over cyber issues because they come in with, this is crime, this is espionage, this is warfare, here we are. Private sector, you don't really have a voice here. Um, and it really trips them up because, I mean, try talking to... A, to um, many of the people, I'm sorry to pick on the military, I was in the military for, for many, many years, but they, it's difficult for them to figure out how to deal with civilians because civilians are supposed to get out of the battle space. Civilians don't own the battle space. We were in the Air Force. As soon as Air Force guys are wheels up, they're out off slipping surly bonds of earth and there are no 747s flying through the battle space. Um, but that's completely different to cyberspace where it is owned, operated, maintained, bought for by, our pri by the private sector for their own purposes. And it's a huge distinction. Two last things to close. One, those aren't the only four models that we can approach this as. That's how we've gotten here. That's almost all of us here have gotten here through one of those four channels. But they're not the only ones. Um, you hear sometimes we borrow from the public health model. When you hear people talking about cyber hygiene, isolation, quarantine, there's a whole rich set of norms that are built around the public health model. And Scott has been involved with that. DHS has been involved with that. And we can borrow a lot of that to say, let's look at this as public health. It's especially strong for incident response. When there's a fast-moving incident like a virus um, where it's almost directly applicable. We can also borrow from environmental norms. For example, since we have lawyers on the room, trail smelter case, where the international tribunal, something like 100 years ago, that judged that Canada has to pay the United States because industrial pollution came across the border, killed crops and vegetation in the United States, and Canada had to pay for this cross-border emissions. I think that's not just analogous, but you could use concepts like that, or polluter pays, um, as directly applicable to cyber. And it gets us away from the secure. As soon as we say security, someone else is going to say privacy. But in environmental norms, we volunteer to give up certain rights that we have in order for a larger global good. Where we say, I don't have to bring a silly bag with me to the supermarket. Where did that norm come from? But now I feel like a jerk. If I show up and I don't have a bag, I'm giving up my rights to have you give me this bag 
I live in Virginia, so I don't have to pay. Um, and, but right, but we see this all the time where you've got companies and you've got elected politicians that all try and outgreen one another because they think it's going to sell well. If we thought of cyberspace not as a domain of warfare, jumping right into the, in, into the warfare model, but as an environment that we are polluting, all of a sudden it changes a lot of things and, and, and might be more able to get agreement. Last Got to be the last is point. To go, is, <laughs> is to go back to our moderator. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Thanks, Frank Salufo. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. I want to make sure there's a, an opportunity for questions, and there was a lot uh, addressed here. And, and let's start with the easy one. Let's start with uh, China. Um, it is getting a bum, lot of bum, news, bum. but by no means are they the only country engaged in, in very significant computer network exploit, e exploitation. I think, firstly, one of the things you've got to tease out is attack versus exploit, not always mm -hmm. the same. Cyber technology changes, its application changes, human nature doesn't. Espionage is allegedly the second oldest profession. So you bring that into, into, into effect. What do we do? What is the right? I mean, now you've got a, a head of state speaking to a head of state. One would argue if you continue to see such activity, we're inviting not only the Chinese but everyone else to engage in significant uh, and wholesale computer network, network exploitation. Where do we, how do we, what are the levers? I mean, you've got strategies such as treasure, treasury and looking at trade sanctions. You've got uh, military applications, obviously, at the highest end. And I'm probably the hardest line one on this, and I'll bite my tongue on all those things. But where do we, uh, where so, do we So get? maybe it's, it's easier to look at all the range of options you have if we take it out of the context of China instead of using the context okay, of China. Okay, so exploit attack. So, so, so uh, you know, I do think, as in the China situation, it's important that we do raise this uh, and make it clear that this is a concern and that we want to have more of a discussion about this issue, that you know, cyber events emanating from China have been a real concern. You've heard Tom Donilon say this. You've heard the president say this. You've Very heard aggressive. Others. And, so, and, that's, and that's important. And it gets attention and it gets a dialogue going. And that dialogue is one way you, you get there. So that's part of it in the long term. Part of it is you build a long-term norm that this kind of activity mm -hmm. is unacceptable. And countries that are outside of that norm are marginalized more and more. And that takes time. That's not an, an immediate fix. That takes a long time, frankly. Uh, but part of it is, as you see this activity around the world, you have, or any other cyber activity, whether it be uh, the kind of intrusions and theft of intellectual property or even uh, attacks on infrastructure, depending on what it is, we have, and we've said this in our international strategy, as Jay knows, you have, we're going to use the full set of tools that we have as, as a government uh, and, and, and to, to meet various threats. And those tools could be the diplomatic tools that I've talked about. They could be economic tools. They could be law enforcement tools. They could be military tools, but military tools, as we said in that strategy, is a last resort. And, uh, you know, and after we've exhausted other remedies and at the direction of the president, uh, you have to be careful when you think about these issues uh, that you don't escalate something and it gets out of control. Signaling is not very good in cyberspace right now. It, you know, there's not a good way to signal uh, back and forth among countries that maybe not, don't trust each other that much what, what our intentions are. And so we have to be, that's, that's why the trust building and confidence building measure uh, efforts are so important to build better trust and understanding. That's part of it too. So it's not a single bullet. It's a mix, mixture of different things depending on the situation. And it also, frankly, you know, cyber is not this thing that exists in some silo or vacuum. You have exactly. to look at this in terms of the larger relationship with whatever country you're dealing with, the economic relationships, the political relationships, the world influence relationships, there's a lot of factors in all these cases that you need to take into account. I want others to jump in that, but Chris, part of my concern is, is we have put those markers in the sand, and yet we're still hearing from people like the head of Cybercom, the greatest theft in U.S. history. Uh, well, he made that um, statement last year. When, he, uh, that, when Keith that strategy right, came right, right after, and then you right. have other similar <laughs> statements right. making the same, and we right. haven't done much. And, so, in and, a weird way, <laughs> you've advertised, you've named, we've named names, but what's the consequence? I called his speechwriters after that, and I said, "You didn't really put that in his speech, did you?" And they said, "No, no, he said that without us." So, 
Don't go. Don't it's go on to, the record. Don't go to town on that. Uh, the greatest theft in human history. So. But other thoughts on that? I mean, well, Scott, and you've got a completely different perspective. Well, but part of it is we just heard the the term, you know, CNE exploitation, and Chris talked. What type of exploit exploitation are we talking about? Political. So one. there's there's military espionage, <clears throat> and there's economic espionage. How many people in this room think that the U.S. government does military espionage against adversaries? How many think that foreign governments do military espionage against us? How many of you think this will ever stop? All right, so part of the challenge is, you know, what I see in a lot of the rhetoric is people say, China or this country that is doing espionage, and they deny it and claim, no, espionage is happening to them. And then we're silent, right? The reality is a lot of countries do military espionage. They've been doing it from time immemorial. Get over it. The real problem, in part, is that some countries do economic espionage and others do not. And some countries allow economic espionage by companies and don't enforce norms. And, you know, it's, it's interesting, again, to think about parsing this out. And we had a little of this discussion earlier. Um, but, I, again, I'm going to say that it's really interesting if you think about what you want the norms to be. And here's why. Military espionage has been around forever. Yeah, now you can look at espionage against private sector companies. And I'm, I'm going to use Boeing as an example because they're an interesting one. Suppose a foreign nation state hacked into Boeing to get the plans for a military <laughs> Air Force fighter jet. Military espionage? Probably, right? What if a foreign country hacked into Boeing to get access to the plans for the 787 Dreamliner? Commercial espionage? Probably. Suppose a, a country says, we're going to hack into the telcos <coughs> and the banks and into Windows. Why? Because the military has to pay their people, which means the banking system's implicated. They need to use telecoms, and they use Windows in the Pentagon. So it seems to me we need a clearer discussion about the issues. There is military espionage against military targets. There's military espionage against private sector companies engaged in military activities as contractors. There is attack on private companies for economic espionage. And there are attacks on systems that indirectly aid military operations, but if you look at it, proportionally, they're far more engaged in civilian operations. If you come back to the ideas of proportionality, you might say, you know what? The telcos, Windows, Windows runs on 1.2 billion machines. Most of those machines are not military machines. They're machines of grandmothers and children, and right? So if you start applying just basic concepts of proportionality, you could decide what do we expect to be fairly targeted and what do we think we really shouldn't allow to be targeted and then frame the discussion appropriately. And if more governments, I think, came out and said, yeah, we do military espionage and so do you, right? Directly, then, oh, directly yeah. on that point, um, we had a, we have discussions every once in a while with Chinese officials. And uh, the last one had a painful one-day discussion of economic espionage. And at the end, I don't, of it, I don't use that. I hate that term. We I just, know, yeah, I know. And they even for said for the exact reason Scott said. Don't, it's super confusing. don't use it because it doesn't translate well into Chinese. And I think I said, what was it translated into? Spying. Um, the one of the officials said at the end, look, in the U.S., military espionage is heroic, and economic espionage is a crime. But in China, the line is not so clear, right? And so he got it exactly right. But the look, problem. kids, look, kids, I have bad news for you. There are rules in this game, right? And three times in the last 15 years, the U.S. has gone to countries, some of them technically allies, and said, hey, you've got to back off, right? Then it becomes a diplomatic effort. Yep. How do you exert diplomatic pressure? And in one case, it took several years. In another case, it was very rapid. But we now are in the position where we have to go to China with a diplomatic strategy and say, you have exceeded the bounds, right? There are bounds in this game. <clears throat> You know, you're looking for a rule book like the Talon Manual, it's not there. But people know the bounds and it's time to go and say, hey, back off. 
it takes years. Nobody ever comes out and says, yeah, you caught me, I confess. Right. It's just not going to happen. And, and, but they and, might and, say, they might say, um, it never happened, but I promise you it won't happen again. That's a uh, quote. Jim, and that's, I, I, I think, a, a fair set of points. I mean, in, in many different ways. But it is an unlevel playing field wherein you have foreign intelligence services supporting individual companies that are subsidized by these countries. And that does require more than simply diplomatic. That's getting to trade-related uh, yeah, Scott, Scott or Chris would probably know this one better, but I, they don't always feel that way. They don't feel like they feel like the field's tilted in our favor. You know, it, it depends where you're sitting. Yeah. Well, I, I beg to differ on that. But, okay. but at the end of the day, uh, the other ch differentiator, I think, is the line between CNE and CNA is so thin and can change based on intent. And that is one thing that changes the old uh, uh, um, traditional, whether it's military or whether it's economic or whether it's industrial espionage. Mm -hmm. Jay, do you want to weigh in on this? Yeah. I don't want to dominate no, this because no, no, uh, I want to get everyone in here. We don't have yeah. much time for it. Real, real quick on China. I mean, uh, we've got a great norm that, that's really kind of become more concrete over the last few years against bribery. And I think in more and more countries, if you've accepted a bribe or you're given a bribe, you understand that you should be ashamed about that and you're likely to be ashamed in, you know, it's going to be difficult to show up to Davos and be taken seriously if your name has been implicated in that. I would be so interested in some kind of norm that we say, if you're a government official or a corporation that's, accept, that, that's tried to steal information from others or you've actually used that information in your product, that we can, that we can similarly shame people that have been involved with that. And we agree, the U.S. agrees with our allies. You, you're, if you're a board member of a company that's, that's used stolen information, you will not get a visa to come to the United States. Your board members will not get a... Your kid will not come and study in the United States. And we get the Brits, the French, the Germans, the Australians, who else? Uh, the Japanese. Um, lots of other countries have been affected by this. There's all sorts of ways that we can, that we can say that this is unacceptable to raise their costs. Um, it doesn't have to be just raising their costs by attacking them or counterintelligence methods. And I'm not sure anyone. Uh, can we open this up to questions now? We have about 10 minutes. I want to make sure we give everyone an opportunity to ask a question. We'll start up front here, Ronald. And please wait for our mic. Don't be shy. Come on. Yeah, we have one. Oh, good. No, good. Keeping with the hairline. And we continue with the hairline. Uh, Ron Marks, Senior Trello here. I guess to, to Jim and, to, and to Scott a little bit, I'm, I'm a little more curious having spent the last day or so at the Chamber of Commerce and the Business Roundtable, so now my mind has been bent in another direction. <laughs> and a little time out in San Francisco recently as well. What, what do you think we should be asking out of the private sector in this? And, and let, me, let me just say one thing about the private sector. It's no knock, because I've lived in Washington now for 30 years and I've done every interagency process known to man. So when I hear Scott go off and I hear you guys go off in the interagency process, I love to hear the details of it because it does matter. On the flip side of it, there's this small land located between Macedonia and Kosovo or whatever else that we keep referring to as the private sector out there, which happens to be about two-thirds of the American economy and probably more than that of the net. So I guess the bottom line for me is what in, in an end state or, in, or as we go toward an end state, what do we expect out of these guys? What would we like to have? What should the private sector expect from the government? What should the government expect from the private sector? Well, I guess it depends if you're asking that as a defensive posture or to deal with some of these trade issues. From a defensive posture, I think the commission's report did a good job of establishing a different model for the public-private partnership, which is twofold. One, information sharing is not an objective. It's a tool. So only share it when it's actionable. And two, the market will provide you with a level of security, but not the level of security required for public safety and national security. Right. You can't make a market case for the Cold War, so we taxed everyone and made them pay for it. <laughs> so the key to the right partnership is having understanding what the market will provide, having the government understand the delta between what the market provides and what they think is necessary, and then using the levers in its toolkit to fill that gap. Everything from economic incentives, tax things, procurement things, to the regulatory aspects of saying you shall do it because thou shall do it. Right. So, you know, I think that model of partnership is working better. And I think the partnership in many ways is as good now as it's ever been because it's actually focused on yielding real results 
and there are actually actual examples of limited information sharing designed to achieve specific objectives. I mean, one of the mm -hmm. classic examples is the deployment now of UEFI signed boot and trusted boot and measured boot, where you know the government and industry had information about potentially changing threat models, and rather than just blasting it out to the world, they talked with the vendors who make that stuff to make it better and you know take concrete steps that were actionable to make the world a safer place. Mm. Okay. And I would have flipped your question. Private sector owes government very little in this space. I mean, it's a crime. I mean, when we think about crime and espionage warfare, the arrows point from the private sector to government. In cyber, it usually goes the other way around. In, in our history of looking at cyber conflict, the government has been decisive in solving very few cyber conflicts. Cyber conflicts are almost always decisively solved by the private sector with the government providing small amounts of support. Um, and so when we're looking at what to do about it, it's usually how can the government help the private sector solve the problems rather than the other way around. But we do have to think about um, the fact that, you know, companies are wedded to their business models mm -hmm. and they're wedded to a particular uh, governance arrangement, security arrangement, designed largely by Americans uh, in the Stone Age. And uh, it doesn't work anymore. So how do we, I feel like on, in the domestic side, I agree with Scott that partnership is better when you think about some of the, uh, the entities, the entity that looked at BIOS, for example, a public-private partnership, great job. On the international side, we don't have that. And so how do we, how do we start thinking about where do we deal with these trade issues, with China in particular? Where do we deal with the fact that the model of internet governance we have now is not sustainable, right? And this is something, the idea of the government just sort of announcing the government's kind of a funny concept to begin with, but you need private sector input to guide you. You need to know how you deal with other nations to get the national interest. And the national interest is the private sector and also the public safety and national security. I want to add two things. Chris yeah. mentioned the point before, which bears repeating, mm -hmm. that not all governments believe in public-private partnership. They actually believe this is a government problem they can so solve on their own, even though they have very sometimes limited understanding of what the technology can do and where it's headed and what the threats are and what remediations are possible. The second thing is, you know, as a publicly traded business with shareholders, and many other country companies are in the same um, predicament, where you look at where the market growth and revenue is going to come from, it's not here. The U.S. is a saturated market. And so it's fine to say, you know, you should protest by not selling in the following 11 countries and just cede the market to your competition, right? I mean, Airbus would love it if Boeing said, here are all the countries we'll no longer sell airplanes to because we're, you know, miffed. That's not a workable strategy for the long term, nor for American security in the long term. Because if America, America's companies just bow out of a whole range of markets because they're uncomfortable with some of the behaviors, that nature abhors a vacuum. Other people will step in and it won't be American products. But no, nobody's talking about that, are they? I mean, who's talking about that? I know that some uh, peaceniks talk about banning uh, surveillance technologies. We went through the old ban the technology stuff in the 90s, and what I've told them is, oh, man, it doesn't work. You're not going to catch this. Don't even try. And we had NSA and FBI and Customs chasing people around. But what, what so are you talking about example. China? Yeah. Well, here's an example. Yeah. Many people came to me. If you remember, there was a flack between Google and China. No. And, really? <laughs> and people came to me and said, Microsoft should get out of China. And I said... The whole company, like, they, they, you know how many Windows copies are running in China? How many legally bought Windows? <laughs> the answer is, the yes. answer is, a lot of both. The question is this, does getting out of China means we don't patch those machines? So they're all vulnerable and then botnetted and then attack people all over the planet? Is that a workable ecosystem strategy? The fact is we made a determine year, determination years ago, which adheres to this day. We patch pirated machines. There were people in the company 
who obviously said, why would we patch pirated machines? Let's make patching contingent on licensing. And from a security perspective, we said, that's a disaster. Yeah. You have to patch it. You don't have to give them added value. You don't have to give them access to services. But you've got to keep the machines patched. And we've patched pirated machines forever. What would it mean for us to stop issuing patches to Chinese IP addresses? It's lunacy. So but I want to ask you a specific okay. question because it just came out last mm -hmm. week. Microsoft does its annual percentages of malware around the world, and China historically was very high. Now has the lowest percentage of malware. What should we make of that? Well, you know, one of the are they inoculating themselves from what they? There's a combination of things. I mean, one is um, there was a period of time when China turned off in large scale a lot of the automatic updating services and therefore also the MSRT which runs when you update which is the malicious software removal tool and the reason they did this comes back to the very point I raised which was um, people we had for a while and we had a lot of discussions about this something called reduced functionality mode that if you weren't genuine your machine would move into a reduced function state and um, the end result of that is China um, you know, the people tried to just start turning off automatic updates everywhere, which meant they had unpatched machines and they weren't having their machines clean. And we have been on a long-term path to remedy that. The second thing is that what has happened is that Chinese companies, 360, QQ, and others, are distributing patches to users, and users have a greater faith in absorbing this stuff from local companies than from foreign companies. So their patching rates are going up, uh, mm -hmm. Removal tools are going up, um, and so I think we're seeing some benefit of that. The goal, though, I, to, for the China policy has to be we have to build a partnership with them. They're not going to go away. They're number two. We, we can have a war with them. That would be a lot of fun. I'm, I think that'd be great. But we really need to think about how to build. No, I don't. Uh, That's you don't the know. headline for yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Jim so, Lewis yeah. declares war on China. No, and Ellen's the, not here. No and the, and the <laughs> Chinese know because I've told them we have to find a way to cooperate. We have to find a way to build a partnership. I'm not sure that's going to be as easy with the Russians in some ways, and I don't know if people think about that. Mm -hmm. China, you know, we can do business with China, right? They have interests. They want to cooperate. They, they like making money. We like making money. I see a deal, right? What's up with a the grand Russians? bargain? Yeah. Actually, I do want to pick up on that. And, and uh, mm -hmm. do you guys want to comment on that? I know you did. Uh, yeah, why don't you go ahead and then I'll. Just, just one, one small uh, notion about the, what, what we sh should or could expect from the private sector. First of all, it it's, should be, uh, un, uh, we should expect that, that the private sector understands what is really going on. I mean, I'm really happy that the, there's so much written about the media, although you said that there was nothing yet. But, but, um, but uh, this really is a good exercise for raising awareness. I mean, in Estonia, we, we, we started with a pilot project of, uh, of having the first graders coding. And, and uh, we always say that, well, try to teach from, from the first grade, really, that if you press a button, that has an implication. And, and I'm, I'm just afraid that the, even if we speak about uh, to any extent of information sharing between the government and private sector, that there are still so many private sector actors who just don't know about anything, who, don't, who are not aware that, that actually they've been st stolen or their property has been stolen. And, and, uh, and this is really the, a lot of, um, in, in terms of awareness question. Well, in Estonia, we have, we've done it quite easily. It's mandatory to, to report any, any incidents. But at the same time, we're a small country also. 1.3. I might also note there's a very unique public-private partnership in the Cyber Defense League, which I think was one of the more innovative programs where engineers from the banking sector, from the, the Skypes uh, uh, of the world, can be brought in to help support, uh, if it's an exploit, the Ministry of Interior, if it's an attack, the Ministry of Defense. In a, in a public-private partnership kind of way. It's a reserve core on steroids specific to cyber. Exactly, and both sides really benefit. Uh, they do joint exercises and, and uh, if needed, joint activities. Chris, you wanted so, to so jump in on this. Two, We're going to have time very, for two, one very, more question after Very uh, Two quick, very things. Uh, things. So, one, 
Yes, I mean, I, I'd agree with what Scott said, or maybe it was Jim said, that at one point uh, we used, uh, threw a bandit around the term public-private partnership without any content. It didn't really mean anything. And what I think we now have done is really put content around it. For what and what are we trying to get out of it? Uh, and that's been both in building some of our policies like our National Incident Response Plan, and it's been, which was built with the private sector, maybe messy process because it's somewhat multi-stakeholder, but it actually ends up with a better product but also exchanging actionable information. I think that's important. And that's something we try to proselytize to other countries around the world. It's a core part of what we, we try to carry forward. And we've done that even in 2003 when we had this G8 critical infrastructure meeting where we said that that was one of the core principles. On, uh, on the theft of trade secrets, which I like to use rather than economic espionage, because espionage, it confuses all the terms. You know, we talk about attack, we talk about intrusions. We really do have to be precise in what we're talking about. Um, you know, I, I think there are costs to that, too, for countries that engage in that, and there are long-term costs, and there are costs to their own competitiveness and their own innovation. There are costs to them in terms of their soft power and how they're perceived by other countries around the world. And there, there are costs in terms of whether countries want to invest in those economies in the long run uh, if they're afraid their trade secrets are going to be taken. So, so that, I think that does play into the mix. We may not, you know, and that, that will happen with any country that, involves, uh, that is involved in that. And it helps you build that norm in the, that, that we were talking about over the long run. Hillary, uh, we have a question up front here. I okay. Uh, I want to sort of jump off of that question. I'm Hillary. I'm one of the executive MBA students here at GW with a cybersecurity focus. Um, I have a question about, I guess we'll call it theft of intellectual property instead of economic, economic espionage. But I have heard discussions that say, that suggest that theft intellectual property could rise to the level of a national security threat. And in that, I want to sort of hear what the panel thinks about the idea that theft of IP can be so severe that it does rise to a consideration that becomes a national security consideration. And when you, instead of saying, I mean, it's a relevant point that the cost to the country is, you know, loss of a soft power and perspective in the way that they're perceived by other countries, I sort of think that the, I wonder if there's a need for a more immediate sort of what would you do if you say yes it is a national security threat does that make it more than a crime and if so what would the US what should a US position be on that and there have been cases <laughs> why is everyone looking at me well um, go ahead Scott <laughs> so um, you know going back to President Clinton uh, we started equating economic security and national security. And in a world that is increasingly economically connected, um, and you know, part of the strategy was always to connect the economies in such an intense way that people couldn't go to war anymore because it would be too mutually destructive to their economies. You can argue that there is a link, certainly in some people's mind, between national security and economic security. And the challenge, with framing it quite that way, is that you turn <coughs> theft of trade secrets into a national imperative. And countries will do much more in the name of national security than they would otherwise do. I mean, if you really believe that stealing trade secrets is key to your national security, why would you stop? You know. But I also think that trade secret theft has to be also put in some context, because it's been very hard to get people to gravitate around it. Part is that, you know, when I steal your car, it's gone, and you're inconvenienced. When I steal your IP, you still have it. And the second thing is the harms are remote in time. If people steal trade secret information, you don't go bankrupt the next day. It is a slow and steady decline as you're out competed and out, you know, in the marketplace. And so that makes it hard for people to adjust. It's also not always clear to people what constitutes a trade secret. I'll give you a practical example. So when I first went to Microsoft, people were talking about protecting the crown jewels. So what do you think our crown jewels are? Code, source code to Windows? We share it with governments. We have a government security program. We share it to them because government said, we think you put in back doors for the NSA. We don't have trust in the supply chain. We said, here's the code. I said, from my government experience, I said, if people are stealing our source code, if governments are stealing our source code, it's because they want to confirm that what we gave them is really the source code. 
<laughs> and if they get it and compare it, they will have more faith in us rather than less. Because very often, countries engage in espionage to validate what they're being told by the other side. You know, so this is a hard problem, but I think it's important if we're going to have success in having normative discussions about theft of trade secrets, you disentangle it from a national security argument. Because otherwise, I think you're starting in the wrong place. It's really about having level playing fields for open competition and innovation and rewarding those companies and organizations that are willing to take risk in the market. You know? And while I'm sympathetic to Chris's point about you know, the cost of economic espionage or theft of trade secrets, the challenge is it is much cheaper and arguably more successful to steal stuff than it is to invest Absolutely. a decade of R&D and billions of dollars Absolutely. to create it in the first place. And, and, and so then I, spend it all on marketing. Right. And so I should be clear. I was saying there are costs. It's not, right, a, costless, it's not a costless enterprise. But I would say, the, the, unfortunately, the benefits largely often outweigh that. Right. Uh, and problem. you have to have a mix of responses to that. Uh, but I do think, yes, we have intertwined, I think, appropriately national and economic security. I think you know, President Obama said back in 2009, that the threats we face in cyberspace are some of the greatest economic, and he led with economic and national security challenges we face. And they are, they are blended to some extent. And I can imagine an, an instance where the kinds of trade secrets, and Scott's right, they're not immediate. You don't see these harms immediately. That's one of the problems with them, because people don't realize the harm that's happening. What happens is down the line, if that innovation, all of you invested in that innovation is gone, if you don't have the incentive to innovate because you know it's going to be taken, and, and, and then industries collapse or they don't have the, the, the same verve that they have now, that's going to be, uh, that, that is going to be very deleterious to an economy. And over the long run, that could have a very strong national security and economic security effect, because I do think they're intertwined a little bit. But, and the reason I say that is I think governments, and, and certainly ours does, take these issues seriously. This is a big issue. And for years, and Scott, you've labored in the, in the, in the vineyards on this too, we tried to convince uh, uh, people that Cybercrime was a big issue, that they really were, even though they didn't actually see the thing going missing, it was a big problem when people were breaking in their networks and stealing stuff. And it took a long time to get people to come to terms with that, and that's still not throughout you know, the private sector. It's not completely true, but many sectors have realized that, and I think that's still a challenge. So I had a, uh, one of these really old senior economists come and talk to me. Uh, someone on our board had sent him and said, he said, you know, you should talk to you this about economic espionage. And he said to me, I won't tell you his name, but he's like one of these gods of economics. And he said, um, could you give me an estimate of the cost of uh, economic yeah. espionage? And I said, I apologize. Uh, we're at a very preliminary stage of our research. This is an embarrassing range, and we hope to narrow it over time. But I would say the minimum <coughs> might be $20 billion a year, and the maximum might be $100 billion a year. Noting that, you know, there's all sorts of problems. It's a preliminary estimate. Quack, 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 quack. And he looked at me and he said, $100 billion? That's a rounding error in a $15 trillion economy. And he's right. It's a rounding error, right? The goal here is to build partnership. The goal here is to get the Chinese to play by the rules and everyone else, too. The goal is not to have confrontation or conflict. It's not a Cold War. We can't be in a Cold War with our biggest trade partner, right? They can't be in a Cold War with us, so there's leverage on both sides. As their national security concerns, sure, it's very disturbing to see uh, crucial military technologies uh, purloined through espionage. This is a problem we've dealt with before. We know how to do it. We're on the path now to dealing with it. So bear in mind we have, and this, I tried to get that in my remarks at the beginning, we have a serious national security problem that involves defense and espionage, but we have to maybe embed it in this larger context of global economic partnership. Right? It's very difficult to think about a war in that context through anything except miscalculation. And so that's where I think we're on the right path. If you look closely at the President's remarks, at uh, Secretary Liu's remarks, uh, Secretary Kerry's remark, they don't refer to the PLA, they don't refer to the military. They describe this, this is probably you, um, they describe it as a trade problem, an economic problem, a commercial problem, where we have to find a way to compete fairly. And, and interestingly, and Tom Donilon too, 
said one of the key things we want from the other side is a discussion and a sustained dialogue on these issues, mm -hmm. which is an important point. Yeah. And that's part of that partnership issue. On that note, I promised we'd wrap up by 5 o'clock. I'm five minutes behind. Before um, uh, we let our colleagues go here, I want to leave them with a token, figuratively and literally, of our appreciation <laughs> and our coin. Where was and, it made? Uh, in the United States. No. <laughs> uh, but, uh, and um, we also have um, a reception afterwards, thanks to Microsoft. Uh, so please join us, and please join me in thanking our speakers. For a Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you.